in the northern hemisphere, the days are growing shorter, and the air, crisp as the snap of a Halloween apple, makes our cheeks ruddy. Join me to finish our two-parter about two hauntingly special and magical women. Well, more than one if we're talking about the Oracle of Delphi, right? And the myths and stories surrounding Circe have identified her as a witch, an enchantress, and even as a goddess. There is a mountain of artwork about Circe, from being on the sides of pots and vases from ancient times, to oil paintings, and yes, the pre-Raphaelites took a stab at painting her as well. Her story has called to artists throughout history to be illustrated, and you'll see some of these pieces on Instagram and others on Facebook when you look for the Whispering Gallery. So who did Circe turn into pigs? What specialty of magic could have done that? Did she really live alone on an island? Find out next on the Whispering Gallery. The following episode was recorded a while back when Emily was still co-hosting The Whispering Gallery, so this is a special episode. I'm going to be covering Cersei. Basically, I'm just going to be covering her story, um, just because I feel like there's so many different works of art that involve Cersei that I kind of thought it would just be best to cover her story and then kind of um, show the different artwork on her Instagram Sorry about Boomer in the background. Had a cold snap here in Utah, and he's just kind of ramped up, and he's outside, and so if you can hear him barking, we're sorry. We're just trying to get this recorded so we can share it and keep rolling. Our recording happens in the art studio right now, so that's also why it might be a little echoey, but um, we're right next to the dog door. But that's our situation right now. Yep. So... Um, So just as a quick disclaimer, though, um, keep in mind that like all myths, Cersei's story has many deviations, so I'm just covering the most well-known versions and bringing up other possibilities or pertinent info as it becomes relevant. And was she one person? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Like, given what happened with the Oracle... (laughs) So just as a quick overview, um, Circe is an enchantress in Greek mythology. She was renowned for her knowledge of potions, herbs, and witchcraft. Through the use of these and a magic wand or staff, she would transform her enemies or those who offended her into animals. And that was pulled from uh, Circe's Wikipedia page. She is a daughter of the god Helios, and either the Ocead nymph Perse, I think is how you say it, or the goddess Hecate. Her brothers were Aedas, um, the keeper of the Golden Fleece, and father of Medea, and Perseus. Her sister was Pasiphae, who was the wife of King Minos and the mother of the Minotaur. So I'm gonna kind of dive into her like family line a little bit just because I think this is like fascinating and also I think it kind of ties in how you view Circe like as such a powerful being because of her like lineage and where she comes from. So Perse, um, Circe's most likely mother, is like I just said, the most commonly accepted candidate for Circe's mom. Perse was an oceanid nymph. The Oceanids were the 3,000 minor water deities that were the daughters of Oceanus and Tethys. Perse was one of the wives of the sun god Helios. Their children are Ateus, Perseus, Pasiphae, and Circe. One of her Oceanid sisters is the wife of Poseidon, um, whose name was Amphitrite, I think. Wow, you've got so many names and words. I am just, (laughs) I hope no classical scholars are listening to me right now. (laughs) We're trying. Yes. Yeah. So a quick aside on Circe's maternal grandparents, if Perse is her mom. So Oceanus was the titan son of Uranus and Gaia. He was the father of the river gods. If you're a bit familiar with Greek mythology, you might be wondering what the difference is between Poseidon and Oceanus. Poseidon was the god who was able to control the sea, and Oceanus was actually looked at as the deity that physically represented and personified the sea. 
So during these ancient times, the sea was viewed as an incredibly large river that surrounded the known world. And this was pulled from greekboston.com slash culture slash mythology slash Oceanus. Tethys was the sister and wife of Oceanus. She is the mother of the river gods as well as the Oceanids, which I feel like bears specifying due to the affairs that run through mythology. Tethys doesn't really play a role in Greek mythology. She has no established cults, but she has been depicted decorating mosaics in like baths and pools. So kind of like around water things, she's used as more of like a... Good decoration or... Mm -hmm. Okay, the subject matter kind of... Mm -hmm. The other theory is that the goddess Hecate is Circe's mother. Circe is described by Daedarus Siculus in the first century BCE as the daughter of Hecate and King Aedas. Hecate is the goddess in ancient Greek religion and mythology, most often shown holding a pair of torches or a key, and in later periods depicted in triple form. She is variously associated with crossroads, entranceways, night, light, magic, witchcraft, knowledge of herbs and poisonous plants, ghosts, necromancy, and sorcery. So she's different than H-E-C-A-T-E? No. Same thing. It's just a different spelling. Oh, sorry. I didn't read that. But so is she the goddess of the hearth as well? No, that's Hestia. Hestia. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. There's a lot of of H's. Hera, Hestia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Her earliest appearance in literature was in Hesiod's Theogony in the last third part of the 8th century BCE as a titan goddess of great honor with domains in the sky, earth, and sea. Hecate was one of several deities worshipped in ancient Athens as a protector of the household. Alongside Zeus, Hestia, Hermes, and Apollo. Regarding the nature of her cult, it has been remarked she is more at home on the fringes than in the center of Greek polytheism. Intrinsically ambivalent and polymorphous, she straddles conventional boundaries and eludes definition. And that is from Hecate's Wikipedia page. To complicate matters, Hecate is closely tied with Perse. Hecate was a virgin goddess who had no regular consort. One of the ways that illustrates this is the spelling of Perseus as P-E-R-S-E-I-S, which is derived from the Greek word perso, which means to destroy, to slay, or to sack with fire. So basically, Circe's oceanid mom option, Perse, um, another spelling of her name is Perseus. Okay, so that kind of ties her in, and I've seen lots of theories saying that she's closely tied to Hecate because of the meaning of her name. So There seem to be kind of a lot of asterisks, like on the bottom of your quote from the Wikipedia on Hecate, that she straddles conventional boundaries and eludes definition. Mm -hmm. That just kind of like opens it wide up that like, for so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, though, she does have a lot of like realms that she covers. So I guess you have to be kind (laughs) of... But yeah, so that's kind of her, like, maternal side. And then Circe's paternal lineage, with the part of her mother, like, it's a bit unknown, but her father is definitely Helios. So Helios is the Titan sun god. He functions both as the god and personification of the sun. Helios wore a radiant crown and drove a horse-drawn chariot through the sky. He was the guardian of oaths and also the god of sight. Although Helios was a relatively minor deity in classical Greece, His worship grew more prominent in late antiquity. A late antiquity is generally thought of as being loosely between the 3rd and 8th centuries AD. Thanks to his identification with several major solar divinities of the Roman period, particularly Apollo and Sol, the Roman Emperor Julian made Helios the central divinity of his short-lived revival of traditional Roman religious practices in the 4th century AD. Helios features prominently in several works of Greek mythology, poetry, and literature, in which he is often described as the son of the titans Hyperion, who is the god of watchfulness, wisdom, and the light, and Theia, whose name alone means goddess or divine. Um, She's the titaness of sight, and by extension, the goddess who endowed gold, silver, and gems with their brilliance and intrinsic value, and brother of the goddess Selene, who is the moon, and Eos, who is the dawn. With all of this genealogy laid out, you can see that Circe has a pretty impressive family tree. She's related to at least two titans, as well as the sun, the moon, and the dawn. Since we've fleshed out her background a little more, let's dive into the sorceress herself. 
Was she a real person? Do they believe like the like the Oracle of Delphi? They believed were real women. No, most likely not. So she was a like a mythological sorceress. Mm-hmm. So Circe's life um, is generally started while living in her father's domain. So kind of the first myth that's associated with her is that she fell in love with a sea god named Glaucus, whose original story is told by Ovid and Metamorphosis. According to Ovid, Glaucus began his life as a mortal fisherman living in the city of Anthedon. He found a magical herb which could bring the fish he caught back to life and decide to try eating it. This herb made him immortal, but also caused him to grow fins instead of arms and fish tails instead of legs, though some versions say he simply became a merman-like being. This forced him to dwell in the sea forever. Glaucus was initially upset by this side effect, but Circe's maternal grandparents, Oceanus and Tethys, received him well and he was quickly accepted among the sea-dwelling deities. While Circe fell in love with Glaucus, Glaucus only had eyes for the nymph Sight. I think it's Skyla. I'm sorry, I'm butchering this pronunciation, but I'm doing my best. So, the nymph Skyla. To take revenge on Skyla, Circe poisoned the water where she bathed, which turned her into a monster who later became famous for wrecking ships alongside Charbidis. It was believed that Charbidis lived under a rock on one side of the strait. Opposite Charbidis, Scylla lived inside of a rock. And that's pulled from uh, Glaucus's Wikipedia page, that little Wow, so that was just like a scary story. Mm-hmm. So is Cersei a, a bad sorceress or a good sorceress? I mean, like, it fluctuates for sure. Okay. <laughs> I think mostly, like negative just because she kind of uses it as like a way to like like transform her enemies so but i don't think she's like an evil person but i do think that kind of like her sorcery kind of leans negatively so a similar tale of scorned love occurred when cersei fell in love with picus a son of Kronos. in metamorphosis 14 she meets picus because she goes to the hills of laurentum in search of herbs cersei tries to seduce picus but was scorned again Picus was in love with Sainis, a daughter of Apollo. Picus rejected the advances of Circe, who then transformed him into a woodpecker. When friends of Picus came to Circe to look for him, Circe transformed them into other animals as well. This myth shows the way that fauna was developed on Mount Circe. And that's pulled from mythology.stackexchange.com slash question slash 5634 slash why is Circe in Aea. Wow, that was crazy. In just that, that small paragraph, it's like it's the a whole... roller coaster of a story for sure. Holy cow, that's like um, what are those the like the beginning like the foundation like the source myths? What are they called? The oh, the creation myths. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's wow. Like, I know it's crazy. Um, so during this period in Cersei's life. Um, it seems like this is where she takes up residence on the island of Aea. Sorry, that's a lot of vowels, and uh, <laughs> it's A E A E A. First one says it sound like its name, so A. Second one goes to sleep. Does that still so, work with Greek pronunciation? A yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like you said, I have no idea. That's, I was I just trying know. to sound my way no, through I it. No, I know. It's like um, what? <laughs> There are some differing accounts on how she ends up here, though. One story seems to be that her father Helios and his court banished her there for killing her husband, the Prince of Colchis. I couldn't find any info or a name for her husband on this marriage other than this. This seems to be almost certainly confounding Medea's story with that of Circe. Medea is famous for having killed her own brother, who would have been the Prince of Colchis, while being pursued on her way out of the country by her father. And that was again pulled from mythology.stackexchange.com. My favorite possibility for how Circe ended up there um, and residing in seclusion was because she chose to. In terms of her story, living alone on a deserted island helps up the spookiness factor as well as playing into the feminine mystique that's so often associated with her. So Circe's home on the island does not appear on any modern map, and in antiquity, there was great debate about whether Aea was to be found. Locations were given for the island of Aea on both east and west of Italy, and Apollonius of Rhodes tells it of being south of Elba, 
but within the site of the Tyrian coastline. So she lived in the stone mansion located in a forest clearing on this island, and that was pulled from greeklegendsandmyths.com slash Circe. Circe had her own throne and was attended to by various nymphs and animals, and in Book 10 of the Odyssey, it's stated that Circe's house is tended to by certain wood nymphs who come from groves and by a couple of varieties of water nymphs who come from springs and from the sacred rivers flowing seawards. These nymphs also gave flowers and herbs which she used in her potions. In some retellings, the animals that surround her home are former lovers that she's transformed, but in his 3rd century BC epic, the Argonautica, Apollonius Rhodus relates that Circe purified the Argonauts for the death of Absyrtus, possibly reflecting an early tradition. In this poem, the animals that surround her are not former lovers transformed, but primeval beasts not resembling the beasts of the wild, nor yet like men in body, but with a medley of limbs. Um, And that's, again, pulled from Circe's Wikipedia page. More modern myths speak to her leaving or even destroying the island, after which she moved to Italy and came to be identified with Cape Circeo, which lines up with the previous story of Picus and how all of the flora and fauna was kind of developed from that interaction. Okay. Like I mentioned at the start of Circe's story, she's most well known through her involvement in the Odyssey. To briefly sum that story up, during Circe's time on Aenea, Odysseus and his crew landed on the island on their way back from the Trojan War. Circe is initially described as a beautiful enchantress living in a palace isolated in the midst of a dense wood on her island. Around her home prowl strange docile lions and wolves. She lures any who land on the island to her home with her lovely singing while weaving on an enormous loom, but later drugs and enchants them. One of her Homeric epithets is polypharmakos, which means knowing many drugs or charms. And that's again pulled from her Wikipedia page as well. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Circe invites the hero Odysseus's crew to a feast of familiar food, a pottage of cheese and meal sweetened with honey and laced with wine, but also mixed with one of her magical potions that turns them into swine. Only Eurylochus, who suspects treachery, does not go in. He escapes to warn Odysseus and the others who have remained with the ship. Before Odysseus reaches Circe, Hermes, the messenger god sent by Athena, intercepts him and reveals how he might defeat Circe in order to free his crew from their enchantment. Hermes provides Odysseus with the herb moly to protect him from Circe's magic. He also tells Odysseus that he must then draw his sword and act as if he were going to attack her. From there, as Hermes foretold, Circe would ask Odysseus to bed. But Hermes advises caution, for the treacherous goddess could still unman him, unless he has her swear by the names of the gods that she will not take any further action against him. Following this advice, Odysseus is able to free his men. After they have all remained on the island for a year, Circe advises Odysseus that he must first visit the underworld, something a mortal has not yet done, in order to gain knowledge about how to appease the gods, return home safely, and recover his kingdom. Circe also advises him on how this might be achieved and furnishes him with the protections he will need and the means to communicate with the dead. On his return, she further advises him about two possible routes home, warning him, however, that both carry great danger. Also, during this time spent on the island, Circe and Odysseus have two children, Latinus and Telegonus. Telegonus, who ruled over the Tyrosinoi, that is the Etruscans, The Telegoni, an epic now lost, relates the later history of the last of these. Circe eventually informed him who his absent father was, and when he set out to find Odysseus, gave him a poisoned spear. With this weapon, he killed his father unknowingly. Telegonus then brought back his father's corpse to Aea, together with Penelope and Odysseus' other son, Telemachus. After burying Odysseus, Circe made the others immortal. According to an alternative version depicted in Lycophron's 3rd century BCE poem, Alexandra, and John Tsetse's Scolonia on it, Circe used magical herbs to bring Odysseus back to life after he had been killed by Telegonus. Odysseus then gave Telemachus to Circe's daughter, Cassiphone, in marriage. Sometime later, Telemachus had a quarrel with his mother-in-law and killed her. Cassiphone then killed Telemachus to avenge her mother's death. On hearing of this, Odysseus died of grief. And this was again pulled from the Circe Wikipedia page. 
So it's just a real cluster. So. Yeah. Yeah. Bring him back to life and then he dies again. uh Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So just the drama though. But I had an amazing elementary school teacher who always said that Greek mythology was like a soap opera and I totally see it here. Because of her interaction with Odysseus and his crew, Circe became viewed as the archetype of the predatory female. In the eyes of those from a later age, this behavior made her notorious both as a magician and as a type of sexually free woman. Due to this iconic status, she has been frequently depicted in the arts from the Renaissance down to modern times. There's an amazing poem by Margaret Atwood called Circe slash Mud Poems, which came out in her 1974 poetry collection entitled You Are Happy, that I would really encourage everyone to check out. It was worth a read, and I always love when modern works take on the personification of an ancient myth. Also, if you're interested in hearing the story of Circe more in depth, um, I would recommend checking out the novel Circe by Madeline Miller. It's been a really like best-selling popular title. I know um, she also has one um, called The Song of Achilles, which is kind of in the same vein, like kind of a, not a retell, well, I guess kind of a retelling. Um, but yeah, I'm about halfway through the, the Circe novel and it's pretty good so far and I recommend it. Cool. So it's no wonder that there are so many works of art related to Circe. This sorceress is just dangerous and mystical enough to keep people guessing. I'll be doing a few posts on Instagram so that you can see just a few of my favorite pieces that showcase Circe as well. Good deal. So that's all I have. Okay so we were kind of talking about doing a bonus feature with like a, a witchy drink since it's October and We thought it would be fun to to throw something in. So I ordered from Starbucks, which I don't necessarily love Starbucks, but I feel like it's the most applicable coffee shop for everyone. So I ordered a a green iced tea with coconut milk and a scoop of blackberries. And it is just this really pretty purple color with the blackberries. It kind of makes it look a little bit like a potion, which I thought was really fun. I tried a green tea crap with huckleberry when we were up in Wyoming on, on our trip up to South Dakota. Yeah. So that was pretty good. Um, another pretty drink that I think it was a cold brew, um, and that was a Starbucks one I saw, and it had cream or milk. Oh, was it the pumpkin? Yeah, I tried it, and it was, I don't know, I like my fluffy uh-huh. drinks, so it was a little bitter for me, but <laughs> but it was very pretty and potiony. Because they left it to like seep into the coffee underneath and make it pretty, so. Yeah, the pumpkin cream cold brew. It's been a big hit with my uh, co-workers. In the studio dog realm, Shotzi and Boomer are, are fine, but we're getting sweaters for them. Um, yeah, so I think cold. my dogs are good. Weetzie hates the snow. Um, Sam and Cy are okay with it. How much did you get yesterday? Um, probably about an inch and a half. Inch and a half? Because we, we got like a skiff on the roofs. And like on some of the plants. Mm-hmm. It didn't stick to any of the roads or the sidewalks, but it did stick to the plants and kind of, I don't know, everything other than sidewalk. You guys were colder than us for a while. Mm-hmm. When I checked the temperatures, it was maybe five to seven degrees colder than us. That's crazy. I yeah. feel like you guys would be colder because you're like up higher. Well, you guys are kind of on the other elevation across the valley from us. That's true. What monster is made entirely out of blood? Oh, that's gnarly. I don't know. It's a hemogoblin. Oh my gosh. <laughs> See, it sounds horrible. But you go into it and it's like, oh. Yep, that's actually okay. <laughs> Just covering the story is like better in some respects because there's so many pieces of artwork that it's, I don't know. It gives you more of like a broad overview of why that person was being covered so much. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like they're more mystical than maybe our story pushed out there, our stories. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're, I mean, you definitely wouldn't want to run into Circe. No. On an island after dark, let alone daytime. No, definitely not. And the Oracle of Delphi could have been your grandmother or your best friend at one point in mm-hmm. history. We hope you guys have a happy Halloween and that it's mystical and fun and spooky and all that. Definitely. In a good way. Good year this year for Halloween with it being on a Saturday, so. Yeah. So, okay. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. I have a couple of other things to cover real quick. 
If you like this episode and the show, I hope you'll be able to rate the show and review it and subscribe so you can hear coming stories. I'd really appreciate it. And if you'd share episodes with your friends and family, that would be great too, to help the show grow. Thank you. And if you'd like to support the show another way, you can go to Buy Me a Coffee to my account, which is buymeacoffee.com slash Suze, which is S-U-Z-N-I-K-A-R-T. So it's Suze Nick Art. And thanks so much. I appreciate it. If you are looking for a couple of other spooky episodes or podcasts for the season, I would suggest Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness. As of October 19th, 2022, the episode How Do Cults Fashion Themselves with Sarah C. Bird. That was a really interesting episode. Another would be Expanded Perspectives with the guys Kyle Filson and Cameron Hill. I recommend the episode from July 7th, 2022, Stairway to Nowhere. That was pretty creepy. And the last one I would recommend this time is Jim Harold's Campfire, the episode I Saw a Winged Creature on September 22nd, episode 571. At the time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 46 seconds, you can actually listen to me tell a family ghost story. Please look for us on Facebook and Instagram under Whispering Gallery to see the art that complements this episode about Circe. And I also shared a beautiful deck of illustrated oracle cards. The cards were created by Maya Toll and illustrated by Kate O'Hara. This finishes up the episodes about vaporous prophecy in the Oracle of Delphi and the gossamer magic of Circe. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. And now, as Halloween and Samhain, which in Celtic means end of summer, approaches, and people say the veil thins between the world of the living and dead, that you will remember to keep your flashlights close and your spooky art stories closer in case the lights go out in the Whispering Gallery. (laughs) 